You are listening to the Toxic Mold Podcast with Steve Worsley, the toxic mold expert and your number one source for mold consulting and mitigation in the USA. Let's dive into a brand new episode. Before we get started on this episode, here's a not so short disclaimer. While all attempts have been made to verify the content provided in this podcast, neither the podcaster or the producers assume any responsibility for errors, omissions, or alternative interpretations of the issues discussed here. All information stated in this podcast is the opinion of Steve Worsley. Steve Worsley is a mold specialist with over 25 years of experience in the construction and mold industry. The Toxic Mold Podcast is for information sharing purposes only. The views expressed are those of the podcaster and his alone. These views should not be taken as expert instruction or commands. While there may be references to medical conditions and symptoms, all podcast episodes are the opinion of Steve Worsley and any medical questions or concerns shall be addressed with the appropriate licensed medical professional or professionals. As the podcaster refers to different mold types, please be aware that Steve Worsley is not a microbiologist and questions concerning mold specifics should be answered by the appropriate professional. Steve isn't nor does he offer any legal advice. For any legal advice, you must speak with a lawyer. The listener is 100% responsible for his or her own actions. You can check out Steve's books on Amazon. Just go to Amazon and search for author Steve Worsley. You can also take Steve's courses on Udemy or Skillshare, and you can find out more about those at cnccontractorservices.com. Now, let's get to the episode. Hello, you're listening to the Toxic Mold Podcast with myself, Steve Worsley, and we have my wife, Cassandra. How are you? Good. How are you? It's just getting colder and colder by the day. Yes, it is. (laughs) Before we know it, it's going to be Christmas. And New Year's. Yeah. And then, and then, then my birthday month, all month long in January. <laughs> yeah, I forget you celebrate the whole month. All 31 days. <laughs> Anyhow, so today we have a really, really important topic. And the title is How to Stop Toxic Mold Growth. So when you hear that, like what comes to your mind? Well, so many people mention toxic mold nowadays that I, I, I think, well, what exactly are you talking about? I mean, it's a very big issue for people now, toxic mold. I'm not even sure that most people, when they use the term toxic mold, they know specifically what they mean. Oh, I agree. Most people, when they say toxic mold, they're talking about black mold, which is stachybotrys. But like you said, I don't think they know what they're talking about. And I don't expect that. They're not mold specialists. But it's something, it's an important topic to bring up. Stachybotrys, or black mold, is not the only toxic mold out there. There's plenty. Well, but how do you differentiate a toxigenic mold from from an allergenic mold? And is an allergenic mold a toxic mold? So that's kind of a tricky question. We'll backtrack just a little bit. Mold is classified in three different categories. Allergenic, pathogenic, toxigenic. Allergenic, meaning it just causes an allergy. Pathogenic, it can cause an infection. Toxigenic, it can produce mycotoxins and make you really sick. The really difficult part to answer that is when we do traditional mold testing, so we're talking air testing, tape lifts, swabs, that's the cheapest testing because we just send it to a lab. Quickly, they give us the mold results. All they give us is the mold type. So, They'll say that it's Clotosporium or Penicillium or Aspergillus, Catomium. They don't give us the mold species. And my point behind all of that is there's types of Aspergillus that are not harmful and they're allergenic. There's types of Aspergillus like Aspergillus niger that are toxigenic. So for our listeners, to be clear... If you do traditional mold testing, the reason it's so inexpensive is because you're not getting down to the mold species. So we don't even know from those types of tests. So then how, I, I guess I want to go back to the, the wording. When, when people say toxic mold, if it is a mold that doesn't produce a mycotoxin, is it legitimately a toxic mold? No. Okay. So it has to produce a mycotoxin in order to be classified as a toxic mold. Exactly. And I guess my point is with our listeners, like, don't just think because you did, you know, air testing, because there's no stachybotrys there, don't just assume that you're fine. 
Because that's not the case. Yeah. And is it, And I guess the other point is, t- in my mind, there's a difference between classifying something as a toxic mold and being sp- exposed to a mold that is toxic for you. They're different. Yeah. So I think what you're trying to get at is, is that how people react differently to mold exposure. Yeah. Like if you have a child who's a very severe asthmatic and they get exposed to an allergenic mold, which then causes them to have a massive asthma attack that might put them in the hospital. Well, obviously that allergenic mold is toxic to that child who's in a severe yeah. asthmatic. So people need to differentiate between calling something a toxic mold, which is an actual classification of a mold species that produce mycotoxins versus saying my son or I was exposed to a mold that is toxic for my health, yeah. given my issues. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I think, you know, scientifically people can classify things however they want. But if my client was to say to me, Steve, you did air testing, you did some tape lifts. Did you find any toxic molds? I would have to go and explain to them what I just explained. Okay. Like we would have to do more in-depth testing, which those listeners know how I feel about an ERMI. I've been very clear, like I've evolved a little bit in the past. I just really didn't care for it at all. Well, and for those listening to this podcast for the first time, go back and look for the episodes on ERMI so you can hear specifically what Steve thinks about ERMI. Yeah. And those were done a long, long time ago. Like I said, I've, I've evolved or I don't want to say changed my opinion, but it has changed and At the end of the day, for our listeners, if you're going to spend the money to do an ERMI, just reach out to me and I'll I'll tell you to do either an EMA or just a mycotoxin test. In my opinion, those are kind of, and I shouldn't say kind of, but for the most part, that's what you're going to have to do to understand the mold species. But, you know, going back to, like, if my client was to ask me that, like, I have no way of knowing, once again what the history is for my client, for their spouse, for their children, their grandchildren. Like at the end of the day, it's a it's a tricky question. Absolutely. If they say is it toxic mold, what they and my point is is what most people mean is it stachybotrys. That for our listeners, don't just assume it only is stachybotrys that can be harmful to humans. Because many Many mold species produce mycotoxins that are not stacky and that are not black in color. I think sometimes people think only black colored mold is toxic. Black mold isn't really even black. It's just a darker blue, green, I don't know. So at the end of the day, I think it's just uh, this is what people hear all the time from those that are not educated when it comes to mold. So they come up with their own terminology. People come up with their own opinions, which is obviously this is just my opinion, too. So So that's good. Toxic molds are mold species that are capable of producing mycotoxins. Important to know. Yeah. From my point of view, like you said, somebody somebody could be listening and being, you know, they could say, well, an allergenic mold was toxic to my child. Well, at the end of the day, scientifically, if it's not classified as toxic, doesn't mean it can't harm you. Exactly. So how do how would somebody stop toxic mold growth? Well, to know if it's toxic mold, once again, you'd have to get into some extensive testing. But the basics, and I I talk about this all the time with my clients, it's for the most part. It isn't these three things. It's for the most part. There's other factors that you have to consider. But mold needs three main components. The mold spore, which you're not going to get rid of. It obviously needs a food source, which is cellulose materials, so sheetrock insulation, wood, all sorts of stuff. And then it needs to have moisture, which is humidity above 60%. Meaning, the reason I say it that way is just because you didn't have a water leak in an attic doesn't mean that mold can't grow. If the humidity is at 60%, then it can grow. My point is, is it doesn't have to be something leaking per se. It's just elevated humidity. Okay, so it's got to have those three things, the spores, which are naturally present in the air, a food source, cellulose materials, and humidity above 60%. Exactly. If you take one of those components away, well, obviously, if mold's colonized and reproducing, meaning this colony is getting bigger, the infestation, whatever terminology you want to use, you're not going to get rid of the mold spores. Even if there isn't an active colony that you see, mold spores are naturally present. So we don't ever focus on the mold spores. And for the most part, we do not focus on their food source. Unless you're going to build a home that has zero cellulose materials, meaning it's like all concrete. Not sure what else, 
how else to explain it, you're not going to get rid of the food source. The easiest thing we could control and, you know, monitor is the humidity and the water source. Okay. So somebody might listen to that and they go, okay, so I think I have a mold issue in my home and they, they watch a commercial or they run to Home Depot and they find a spray that promises yeah. to get rid of the mold. What do you say to that? Well, it's funny because I was going to add on in there or they see a ad or something on Facebook that claims it kills mold. Just to address that for a lot of our listeners, and I know there's a lot of variables, so don't skewer me over saying this, but a mold spore in the air isn't always viable, meaning it's not even alive. So I'm not sure how you kill something that's not alive, just like a mycotoxin. But if you spray something, let's just say you think you have mold growing behind your toilet in your kid's bathroom. If you go in there and spray it, if it is a toxic mold, it's probably or likely going to release mycotoxins. So you just forced it more or less to defend itself. So it releases the mycotoxins. Those are going to go anywhere throughout the home. Then on top of that, whatever you're spraying, so you go to Home Depot and you buy mold armor, it's a Concrobrium. The people can use whatever terminology they want to use. You can use hydrogen peroxide, whatever you want to use. The majority of those chemicals that you're going to purchase is water. Let's go back to what I said. Mold needs to grow water. water. So you're literally feeding it. Yeah. So the spraying is actually feeding the mold. So don't do that. Exactly. And, you know, for our listeners, if they ask us, well, so do you guys spray and use chemicals? Of course we do. But we're doing it in a controlled environment. Correct. And you have a lot of processes, protocols that go into exactly. when things happen and how they yeah. happen. Yeah. And for our listeners, spraying the mold is not what we're doing for remediation. So to hear the term, you know, and I, like I said, I see it all the time on Facebook, whether it's UV lights or chemicals or anything, it says kills mold. Don't just fall for the whole, it kills mold, so it's going to take care of my problem. Mold has to be physically removed. There you go. So what's your call to action for people? If you think you have a mold concern in your home, don't just spray it. Let's make that really simple. Don't just go buy something or ask a Facebook group and they told you to use 12% hydrogen peroxide and they said to use this and that. Don't just do that. Call a professional and have them walk you through. And once again, you need the right professional. Well, and you can also do a consult with Steve across the globe. Yep. by going to cnccontractorservices.com and signing up for a mold consult. Exactly. I have clients in many other countries. So for those that need, you know, answers to your questions, go to our website, book the, the consultation and we'll set up an appointment and what's 90 minutes, I think is the yep, lowest amount. So, all right. Well, I appreciate all you listeners for listening. Have a great week. Thank you for listening to this episode. Make sure you go to our website at cnccontractorservices.com and sign up for the mold investigation checklist. Again, go to cnccontractorservices.com and get your free mold investigation checklist today. You can also on cnccontractorservices.com find out more about Steve's courses and books and consultations. Once again, go to cnccontractorservices.com.